Hi, this is Matt Baker. Welcome to episode two in my series on the family tree of Christian denominations. In episode one, we looked at the origins of Christianity, how it started off as a sect of Judaism, but then went on to become a separate religion. We then discussed the first two church councils, which clarified what the major beliefs of Christianity were and which produced the Nicene Creed. Finally, we looked at the next two councils in which we started to get some smaller branches of Christianity splitting off from the rest, such as the Church of the East and the Oriental Orthodox churches. So in today's video, we're going to switch gears and focus on two of the largest branches of the tree, the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Both of these very large churches can actually be divided into various smaller churches. So we'll be looking at how each group is organized, as well as the history behind how they ended up that way. Of special note will be some very recent developments involving the church in Ukraine. But first, I want to point out that throughout this series, I'll be collaborating with the YouTube channel Ready for Harvest. As many of you already know, Ready for Harvest is all about Christian denominations, talking about their history and how they differ from one another. What I really appreciate about Ready for Harvest is that while its host, Joshua, belongs to one particular Christian denomination, he always approaches every topic from a very neutral point of view. So, for example, today, since I'm focusing on Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Christians, he too has released a very unbiased video about these same two groups. So, if you want to get some extra information on what I'm discussing today, I definitely recommend that you watch his video after this one. Okay, so before we jump into today's topic, let me first address a few things that came up in the comment section on episode one. First of all, the word extinct. So for example, I indicated on the chart that the Aryan Christians went extinct. While many people pointed out that the Jehovah Witnesses are very Aryan in their theology, which is true. I therefore want to clarify that whenever I show a group going extinct on this chart, I'm always referring to the original group, not to similar groups that may arise later. This is especially important with regard to Jewish Christians. I got a lot of comments from people pointing out that Messianic Jews still exist. Again, this is correct. However, Messianic Jews do not trace a line all the way back to the original Jewish Christians from ancient times. Rather, Messianic Jews are more recent converts. So, in order to make things more clear, I decided to change the label Jewish Christians to Ebionite Christians, the Ebionites being one of the early Jewish Christian sects, similar to or the same as the Nazarenes. I also received several requests to include the Samaritans and the Karaites, so let's go ahead and add them to the chart. Now, some people, including the Samaritans themselves, think that the Samaritan religion is a direct continuation of the religion followed by the Northern Kingdom of Israel prior to the Babylonian exile. However, from an academic perspective, it's more likely that the Samaritans emerged early on in the Second Temple period, when around 450 BCE, they built their own temple on Mount Gerizim. Now, there's a lot more I could say about the Samaritans, but since this series is focused on Christianity, I'll perhaps have to make a separate video about them at some other point. Now, what about the Karaites? If you haven't heard about them, basically the Karaites are Jews who do not accept the teachings of the early rabbis, as recorded in the Talmud. According to some people, they are the direct descendants of the Sadducees. However, the scholarly consensus is that this is not the case, because the Karaites did not actually emerge until the medieval period, which means that it is better to see them as an early breakaway group from Rabbinic Judaism, rather than being completely distinct from it. Another such breakaway group is Beta Israel, 
aka the Ethiopian Jews. Again, some people theorize that this group can trace their origins to pre-Rabbinic times. However, it is clear from their language and customs that they did originally have connections to Rabbinic Jews, but then this connection was severed for many centuries until they were once again reunited with the rest of Judaism in modern times. Okay, let's now turn our attention back to early Christianity. I mentioned last time something called the Pentarchy. The Pentarchy emerged in some sort of official way around the time of the Council of Chalcedon. Basically, by this point, there were five major cities that were key centers of Christianity within the Roman Empire. Originally, there had been just three, Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch. But when Constantinople became the new capital of the Roman Empire, it became important as well. And then there was, of course, Jerusalem, where the whole thing began. So by 451, the leaders of the church recognized five key cities. Each was called a patriarchate because each was governed by a special bishop called a patriarch, meaning father. Now, I changed the chart a little bit to make what happened after the Council of Chalcedon a bit more clear. Basically, the majority of Christians in Alexandria, Egypt, and in Antioch, Syria, did not agree with the Chalcedonian decisions. They therefore broke away from the rest and eventually became known as Oriental Orthodoxy, which is distinct from Eastern Orthodoxy. These days, the two largest churches within Oriental Orthodoxy are the Coptic Orthodox Church in Egypt and the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahedo Church, which became independent from the Patriarch of Alexandria in 1959. However, I should point out that the church in Ethiopia has its own very unique history that goes all the way back to ancient times. And as I discussed in my series on who wrote the Bible, Ethiopian Christians have a unique version of the Bible that includes several extra books that are not found in most other Bibles. Also, since I mistakenly didn't show a photo of the Ethiopian patriarch last time, I wanted to show him this time. This is Patriarch Abun Matthias the spiritual leader of around 40 million Ethiopian Christians. Okay, so let's now return to the Pentarchy. Although most of the Christians in Alexandria and Antioch became Oriental Orthodox, a minority did not. That's why I also show dotted lines that stay within the Eastern Orthodox section, which I've now decided to color red. The Christians in these areas that sided with Eastern Orthodoxy were originally known as Melkites, meaning imperial. That term will pop up again later, so I thought I'd point out its meaning now. But here's the thing. In the 600s CE, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem came under the control of the new religion of Islam. Therefore, these cities became less important in terms of Christian leadership, leaving only Rome and Constantinople as the two main patriarchates. Therefore, a bit of a power struggle eventually developed between Rome and Constantinople. On one side, there was the fact that Rome, as the original seat of imperial power, had been given, back in the early days of the Pentarchy, a sort of precedence over the other four cities. However, on the other side, there was the fact that Constantinople was now the seat of imperial power, and it was the Greek emperor in Constantinople that now appointed the Latin pope over in Rome. As the centuries went by, Rome and Constantinople drifted further and further apart as Europe became divided between the Holy Roman Empire in the west and the Byzantine Empire in the east. This came to a head in 1054 with what's called the Great Schism. The Great Schism can be blamed on many different things, but I'd like to point out just two. One was a disagreement over whether or not Rome and its bishop, the Pope, was the head over the entire Christian church. According to Constantinople, the Pope was just a first among equals. In other words, he held a special place of honor, but in practical terms, he held no more power than the Patriarch of Constantinople. However, according to Rome, the Pope did have actual authority over the entire church. The other major difference related to the Nicene Creed, which I discussed in episode one. 
In fact, I created a bit of a stir because as an example, I showed the version of the creed used these days by Catholics and Protestants rather than the one used by Eastern Orthodox Christians. The difference is this line here known as the filioque, meaning and from the Son. So, as you can see, Catholics and Protestants say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, whereas the Eastern Orthodox Christians say that he proceeds from the Father only. Because of these differences and many others, East and West parted ways in 1054. Now, I should make it clear that it would be incorrect to say that the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church started only in 1054. Instead, it would be more accurate to say that they both started in the first century and that they were simply united up until 1054. So what about the popes then? I mean, the ones from Peter up until Pope Leo IX in 1054. Well, the difference is that Catholics claim that those popes were the leaders of the entire Christian church, whereas in the view of the Eastern Orthodox Church, these popes were simply the bishops of Rome, who, as I mentioned earlier, were, in their minds, simply the first among equals. Okay, so let's now look at how each of these churches are organized today, starting with the Eastern Orthodox Church, which sees itself as a single church, but can actually be divided into 15 equal churches called autocephalous churches. Basically, being autocephalous means that the leader of that church does not have to answer to anyone higher up, other than God, of course. However, the Patriarch of Constantinople is given special precedence and is considered first among equals. This is why the Patriarch of Constantinople is called the Ecumenical Patriarch. Ecumenical meaning representing more than one group. Currently, that position is held by Bartholomew I. Initially, the Eastern Orthodox Church consisted of only five autocephalous churches. These were the four out of the five patriarchates from the Pentarchy, as well as the Church of Cyprus, which had always been seen as being independent all the way back to ancient times. However, over time, more autocephalous churches were added by Constantinople, such as the Bulgarian Orthodox Church in 927, the Serbian Orthodox Church in 1219, and most importantly, the Russian Orthodox Church in 1589. I say most importantly because nowadays the Russian Orthodox Church is by far the largest of the various Eastern Orthodox churches. It is currently led by Kirill, who holds the title Patriarch of Moscow. The Church of Greece and the Romanian Orthodox Church were the next two Eastern Orthodox churches to become autocephalous in 1850 and 1885, which is after each became independent from the Ottoman Empire. The remaining five churches all became autocephalous in the 20th century, or in the case of the Macedonian church, just last year, in 2022. Which leaves two gray areas to discuss. The first being the Orthodox Church in America, which originated as a branch of the Russian Orthodox Church. The Patriarch of Moscow currently recognizes the American Church as being autocephalous, but the Patriarch of Constantinople does not. When it comes to Ukraine, we get the opposite situation. There, the Patriarch of Constantinople recognizes the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, but the Patriarch of Moscow does not. And it's even more complicated than that. And that's because the history of Russia and Ukraine is, well, a bit complicated. You see, both countries trace their origins back to a medieval state called Kievan Rus, which was centered on the city of Kiev. When Christianity first reached that area, the church there was known as the Ruthenian Orthodox Church. However, over time, Kievan Rus disintegrated, and instead the city of Moscow became the dominant city in the region. It was at this point that the Russian Orthodox Church was established, replacing the Ruthenian Orthodox Church. Eventually, all Eastern Orthodox Christians in Ukraine ended up under the jurisdiction of Moscow. 
However, after the fall of the Russian Empire, some churches in Ukraine declared independence and started calling themselves the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church, or UAOC. This church operated separately from the UOC, which still came under the jurisdiction of Moscow. This is why later the letters MP were added to the name, to make it clear that it is part of the Moscow Patriarchate. To complicate matters further, a third Ukrainian church emerged after the fall of the Soviet Union. This one called itself the UOCKP, the KP standing for Kiev Patriarchate. Now, obviously, having three different Eastern Orthodox churches in one country is not ideal. So, in 2018, there was an attempt to merge all three churches into a single church, which would become known as the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. The merger was mostly successful, and now around 80% of Eastern Orthodox Christians in Ukraine belong to the OCU. However, it wasn't entirely successful. For one thing, there are still some churches that are attached to Moscow, although since the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022, these are becoming less. And officially, the UOCMP has now cut ties with the Russian Orthodox Church. Secondly, there was also a disagreement between the newly appointed leader of the OCU, Epiphanius, and the former leader of the UOCKP, Philaret. This disagreement led to Philaret attempting to revive the UOCKP, although so far he's had only limited success. So basically, while there is still some disunity, the new OCU is now the main Eastern Orthodox Church in Ukraine. Now, before we move on, I do want to point out the growing rift between the Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople and the Patriarch of Moscow. For over 500 years now, Moscow has seen itself as being the Third Rome. And since the Russian Orthodox Church is by far the largest of the various Eastern Orthodox churches, it has at times been seen as a sort of rival to the leadership of Constantinople. In fact, when the Ecumenical Patriarch recognized the new Orthodox Church of Ukraine, Moscow decided to break communion with Constantinople, which basically means that they're no longer on good speaking terms. This was made even worse when Patriarch Kirill came out as a strong supporter of the war on Ukraine, whereas Patriarch Bartholomew strongly opposed it. So it's yet to be seen whether or not the current schism will turn out to be a landscape-changing permanent one. Okay, let's now talk about the Roman Catholic Church, by far the largest church in all of Christianity with well over a billion members representing more than 50% of all Christians. Now, when most people refer to the Roman Catholic Church, what they're really referring to is the Latin Church, which is actually just one of 24 churches that make up the entire Roman Catholic Church. The other 23 churches are Eastern Catholic Churches, which we'll be talking about shortly. But since 99% of Catholics belong to the Latin Church, let me take a moment to explain how the Church organizes those 1 billion plus members. So unlike how the Eastern Orthodox Churches are primarily based in single countries with perhaps some churches overseas, mainly for expats, the Roman Catholic Church is spread all over the world. So what they do is divide the world into a few hundred provinces like this. So, for example, although I'm not a Catholic, I live within the Catholic province of Vancouver, which includes most of British Columbia. Within that ecclesiastical province are five dioceses, and each one of those dioceses is led by a bishop. However, one of those dioceses is an archdiocese, led by an archbishop who, in addition to being in charge of his diocese, is also in charge of the entire province. Now, within each diocese are a bunch of parishes, or local churches, each run by a parish priest. So, the closest Catholic church to me happens to be this one. Although I also happen to live fairly close to a cathedral. Growing up, I always thought a cathedral was simply an extra big and fancy church. Well, that's not quite the case. 
Each diocese has just one cathedral, and it's called that because that's where you'll find the bishop, or archbishop, for that diocese. Of course, the most notable thing about the Catholic Church is that above all the bishops and archbishops in the hierarchy is the Pope, who is the leader of the entire church. That person is currently Pope Francis, who is also the bishop in charge of the Diocese of Rome. So basically, whoever is in charge of Rome is in charge of the entire church. Now, like I mentioned earlier, in addition to the main Latin church, there are also 23 other smaller churches, which are the Eastern Catholic churches. These operate independently from the main church, but are still under the jurisdiction of the Pope. Of the 23 Eastern Catholic churches, I am going to point out just the 10 largest. Let's start here at the bottom. These three churches all trace their origins to the Church of the East, which I mentioned earlier. Basically, what happened is that in 1552, there was a schism in the Church of the East that resulted in some congregations remaining in the Church of the East. These are the ones that became the Assyrian Church of the East and the breakaway ancient Church of the East. But at the same time, there were other congregations that decided to join the Catholic Church instead. These became known as the Chaldean Catholic Church. Then there are the St. Thomas Christians from India. These Christians trace their origins back to the Apostle Thomas, who supposedly traveled all the way to India in the first century. At some point, though, the Christians in India became associated with the Church of the East. But then later, some joined the Oriental Orthodox Churches, becoming known as the Indian Orthodox Church, while others joined the Catholic Church becoming known as the Syro Malabar Catholic Church. The Syro Malankara Catholic Church is also based in India and consists of congregations that broke away from the Indian Orthodox Church. So note that there are two different Eastern Catholic churches based in India. The Syro Malabar one follows Eastern Syrian traditions whereas the Syro Malankara one follows Western Syrian traditions. The largest Eastern Catholic Church is actually the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, with over 5 million members. This church traces its roots back to the Ruthenian Orthodox Church that I mentioned earlier. So basically, back in the 1500s, there were some Christians in Ukraine that didn't want to join the Russian Orthodox Church, so they joined the Catholic Church instead. Now, there's also a Ruthenian Greek Catholic Church, but it actually has nothing to do with the Ruthenian Orthodox Church. It actually formed when certain congregations broke away from the Serbian Orthodox Church. Then there's the Armenian Catholic Church, which, as you might have guessed, is based on those who broke away from the main Armenian Church, which is associated with Oriental Orthodoxy. That leaves us with the Coptic Catholic Church, which broke away from the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate in Alexandria, and these three, which all broke away from the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Antioch. Which means that when it comes to the original Pentarchy, we now have way more than five patriarchs for five cities. So as I mentioned last time, there's an Oriental Orthodox Patriarch of Alexandria who uses the title of Pope, but there's also a Greek Orthodox one. Well, now you know that there's a third Patriarch of Alexandria too, a Catholic one who is the leader of the Coptic Catholic Church. In Antioch, it's even more complicated. There's the Oriental Orthodox Patriarch and the Greek Orthodox Patriarch. But there's also three different Catholic Patriarchs representing the three different Catholic churches based in Syria. Now, I should mention, which I failed to do last time, that the city of Antioch is now actually located in Turkey. But for most of history, it was associated with the region called Syria. In Rome, of course, it's simple. There's just one patriarch, Pope Francis. And in Constantinople, it's mostly simple. There's mainly just Bartholomew I, the spiritual leader of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Although technically, the Armenian Church has a patriarch there too. 
Finally, in Jerusalem, there are three patriarchs. There's the main patriarch, who is Eastern Orthodox, but there's also a Catholic patriarch who represents the Latin Church, as well as an Armenian patriarch. So that takes care of the official branches of the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. But before I go, I want to point out a few unofficial or independent branches. In 1870, the Roman Catholic Church held a council that is now known as Vatican I. One of the things that the council decided was that the Pope is infallible. Now, this doesn't actually mean that the Pope never makes mistakes or that he has the power to radically change church doctrine. It actually only applies to special statements that are clearly made ex cathedra, meaning from the chair. Well, there were some Catholics that disagreed with the idea of papal infallibility, among other things. And there happened to be an archbishop in the Dutch city of Utrecht who had already gone independent. So basically, after Vatican I, a bunch of other priests joined with that archbishop to form the Old Catholic Church, also known as the Church of Utrecht. Today, they are led by this man here. Something similar happened in the 1960s, following the council known as Vatican II. One of the main things to come out of that council was the decision to hold mass in local languages instead of Latin. Again, there were some Catholics who disagreed with the various decisions made at the council. This time, those who separated and formed independent Catholic churches became known as sedevacantists, which is a word based on the Latin for empty chair. Basically, these Catholics believe that the office of Pope has been vacant ever since Vatican II. One of the main sedevacantist churches is the Congregation of Mary Immaculate Queen in Nebraska. The Eastern Orthodox Church also has independent branches. There, the separatists are known as Old Calendarists, or True Orthodox. The main issue for them was the switch that the Eastern Orthodox Church made in the 1920s from using the Old Julian Calendar to the New Julian Calendar. Today, most Old Calendarists are found in Romania and Greece. Okay, so that was a look at the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox branches of Christianity. In the next episode, we'll be moving on to the Protestants and Restorationists. And this is where the tree starts to really go in a bunch of different directions. So you can expect that there will be several episodes on the Protestants and Restorationists before we're done. Episode 3 is likely to come out mid-March. Until then, leave a comment with your thoughts. Thanks for watching.